Dr. Galau last year in Portugal and uh, seeing for myself uh, the uh, quite remarkable strategy that the uh, Portuguese have put in place with regards to drugs, and Dr. Galau will talk to you about that this morning. Um, uh, Dr. Galau is uh, currently the president of the European Monitoring Committee on Drugs and Drug Addiction. Um, he was chairman of the Institute of Drugs and Drug Addiction from 2005 to 2012, uh, when he was appointed direct director general uh, of a new structure within the health ministry, res responsible for policy co coordination in the field of illicit drugs and alcohol. Uh, Dr. Galau is a medical doctor with uh, over 20 years experience regarding drug related issues. He has a very long history uh, of being involved in Portuguese, uh, the Portuguese depenalisation or dissuasion uh, model that I'm sure he'll discuss with us in detail. Um, so could you please join with me in welcoming Dr. Galau. Good morning. I must start by Thanking Absat the kind invitation to be here in this wonderful Melbourne, uh, and the privilege to address uh, as a keynote speaker to this audience. Uh, I'm really excited about it, and I hope that we can share views on, on the Portuguese Portuguese model. Um, I must apologize to you because my English is not as good as I would like but uh, I think it's better than your Portuguese, so I'll speak English, <laughs> I'll speak English anyway. Um, what I would get, uh, like to tell you, as you know, the Portuguese, so-called Portuguese model, has been under the international scrutiny in the last few years. Uh, but I would like to explain what led us to the decision of decriminalizing some 11 years ago uh, why uh, the historical uh, way that uh, the problems of, in the field of drugs developed in Portugal and why we took that, that decision and also what are the outputs, what are the results that, you, that we uh, met until now. Uh, I would like also to say that uh, it, it is curious that the first uh, researcher that uh, draw the, the, the world's attention to the Portuguese uh, system was an Australian, uh, Caitlin Hughes, and thank you for that, because since then it's a non-stop <laughs> interest uh, about the model. Well, uh, being here in Australia, uh, continental uh, country, um, there's a, a question of scale. You see this tiny country, uh, the face of Europe facing South America. It's a gateway uh, for a lot of, of problems uh, in, in terms of trafficking. And, uh, uh, it's a small country, uh, quite conservative. Uh, uh, we are around 10 million inhabitants. Uh, we have uh, 18 districts and uh, uh, plus two uh, autonomous regions, as well as in Madeira. And, uh, well, let me tell the, the story. Uh, as you know, we had a fascist regime for almost uh, 50 years in Portugal. Uh, we were a very closed, uh, isolated and conservative society. Uh, it was almost impossible to travel abroad during that uh, period, uh, and we were not a very sexy destination for tourists to, to, to come to visit us. So we were very, very uh, isolated, and we had no problems with drugs. Of course, there was, uh, the, uh, we had some consumers, some, some users of, of drugs. Uh, for instance, uh, among uh, health professionals, at that time, but it was not a mass massive uh, problem. Suddenly, with our carnation revolution, everything changed. With thousands of people coming, uh, coming back from our ancient colonies, Angola, Mozambique, and so on, 
uh, thousands of soldiers, thousands of uh, of settlers uh, who came back. Some of them, or most of them, with habits of using at least uh, marijuana, and they brought tons of it. And the idea of using drugs associated with the, the idea of freedom, something new in our society, led us to a boom of ex experimentation. Uh, some criminal organizations installed in our, uh, in our country just a few, a few years later, trying to explore a new emerging market. So, in a completely naive society, towards drugs, while other societies had the opportunity to, to, to learn how to deal with it. Uh, for us, it was completely new. And there was a lack of information, lack of, we knew nothing about it. We were completely naive. And it was easy to shift from one drug to, to the other, because really, we didn't know about, about them. I was 20 at the time, in 74, so I lived this directly. Uh, uh, and uh, had the opportunity to see, well, look, uh, uh, a group of friends uh, uh, having a, a, a pot of marijuana and uh, someone, oh, I have something new, let's share, let's try another thing. Irwin, for instance. So it was here to get, uh, to get that kind of experimentation at that time and it was easy uh, to, 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 get, uh, to get hooked on it. Um, That boom of experimentation uh, occurred very, very, it was very fast. And the, 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 there were other priorities from the government. And this, the, it took some time, some, a couple of years, to address the first responses to this kind of problem. Uh, some responses in terms of prevention with uh, some terrorist uh, campaigns uh, drugs, debt, uh, madness, uh, well, that kind of, uh, that was, of course, that's what we knew about, about this, the, those things at that time. But, uh, in fact, it, uh, uh, it developed very, very fast. And even if the drug problem in Portugal was always under the European average level, at one time, we had a very small gap between the total number of, of drug users and the problematic drug users. It was a very narrow gap. While in other countries that uh, had the opportunity to learn how to deal with it, that gap was quite, quite big. In Portugal, we could say that almost everybody who tried drugs uh, felt in, into, into addition, in, in problems linked to them. By the end of the 20th century, uh, we had one of the highest prevalence of problematic drug use at European level. Around 100,000 people, uh, problematic drug users, mainly on heroin. At the same time, the visibility of the phenomenon was Huge. We had the biggest supermarket of drugs in, in Europe, in, in Lisbon, Casal Ventoso, uh, uh, an icon. Um, and it became a top political concern because it, it, it became completely transversal to, to all the society. It started among disorganized people as a problematic uh, users, but then it, it spread into medium classes, high classes, everybody. At one time, it was difficult, almost impossible, to find uh, one family and one Portuguese family with no problems uh, linked to, to drugs. And then, so even if we are a very uh, conservative society, a feeling coming from the society began, um, in the sense that, uh, well, I know my son, my nephew, he is someone who needs help rather than being a criminal. So I would say that feeling towards uh, decriminalization started uh, a couple of years before it was decided by politicians. 
By the end of the 90s, the problem was really the first, in pools, it was identified like the first concern of the Portuguese people. Uh, when asked in, on the street, uh, what is your main concern about, uh, about uh, the future of your children? Uh, and people, will, people would spontaneously say drug and drug addiction. And the government tried to address and to find a new way to deal with it. Uh, we started by developing a network of responses in terms of treatment all, all over the country. Uh, we started introducing some arm, arm reduction respo responses. But anyway, by the end of the, of the 90s, uh, the problem was still raising. Uh, AIDS had come along, uh, and we had a devastation, a devastating ep epidemic of, uh, of AIDS among drug users. We had a lot of uh, overdoses, lots of problems linked to that. By the end of, of the 90s, uh, our previous prime minister, Socrates, I don't know if, you, if the name sounds, he was at the time uh, the responsible from, for use policies. And we had a lot of dis discussions about uh, how to deal with the problem. I, I was in charge of the treatment system since 97. So he called me and we had big discussions, but uh, well, we had no responses to, to address the problem. So we decided to put in place a, a, a group of uh, experts, uh, nine people from judges to psychiatrists to uh, psychologists and, and so on. Uh, I was included in that group, and he asked us to, to produce a report on the Portuguese situation on drugs and to, uh, to build uh, some strategic uh, proposals. We did so. We did so in terms of a new way to look at prevention, to treatment, uh, adopting uh, clearly the, the use of substitution treatments for the first time, it was decided to, to go uh, in a decisive way uh, through those, uh, those treatments. We, put, uh, we proposed a set of uh, therapeutic co communities, um, some outreach work, uh, arm reduction measures, needle exchange, uh, all that, uh, some positive discrimination towards employment of uh, drug, uh, drug addicts under treatment. And all that wrapped in a proposal of uh, uh, discrimination, the discriminalization of drug use. If we are assuming that uh, a drug addict is someone who needs help rather than going into prison, so let's, let's do so. And we proposed the decriminalization of the use of all drugs. Uh, because we assume that what really means, what really matters is the relation that uh, someone has with the substance and not the substance itself. So it was the, that the proposal that we assumed. We presented that uh, strategy to the government and it was adopted as a, as a, as a whole. But the question of uh, the, the discriminalization had to be uh, discussed at the parliament because the government himself could not uh, adopt the, that decision. So it was addressed to the, to, to the strategy was adopted in 99, but the question of the discriminalization had to be discussed at the parliament, and it was in the, uh, the, the year 2000. At the same time, a national uh, structure was built uh, to deal with all all the, the, the matters uh, around uh, the drug addiction. It was IDT, Institute on Drugs and, and Drug Addiction. <clears throat> well, of course, uh, at that time at, when it was decided that the uh, Portuguese uh, drug strategy was elaborated, uh, assuming that, uh, well, uh, imprisonment or fee, the most uh, common sentence imposed by first uh, on first-time offenders, didn't solve drug abuse. Uh, we had our prisons uh, f uh, with uh, lots of people um, who, who usually came 
out of prison in a worse shape than uh, when they, they came in. Uh, so it was likely to have to produce counterproductive effects. The national strategy established eight principles, among which the most important is the humanistic one, uh, along with the pra pragmatic principle, pra pragmatistic. Well, uh, the recognition of the human person's full dignity, understanding that human person's life, clinical record, and social social environment. Assumption that the drug user is a diseased person and out to, with the constitutional right to health, and uh, also assuming the offender's full responsibility. Well, the, this, the, as I told you, uh, among the general population, there was a feeling raising that uh, well, uh, we should do so. But uh, at the political level, things were quite different at the parliament. Um, there was a I would say, uh, a break uh, between the left-wing parties that who supported the, this idea and the right-wing parties that uh, used to say, well, Portugal will become a, a new destination for dr drug tourism. Uh, our children will start using drugs from the very, very, very uh, low ages, uh, and the question of the compliance with the United Nations conventions what was also present. We asked <clears throat> for advices to the top uh, jurists of the, of the country, and they told us, okay, uh, if we uh, move this uh, offense from the criminal justice into the administrative offense, we still uh, comply with the, with the United Nations Conventions. So the proposal was to move it away from the criminal system, uh, to take it out of courts, and uh, to turn the use, drug use and possession for use, uh, became an administrative offense. <coughs> Sorry. Well, the law 30 of 2000 assumes that, uh, well, it's no more a crime using drugs. And the, the border, to assume we, when someone is uh, intercepted using, using or carrying drugs, uh, the border for assuming is a user or a trafficker is as arbitrary as any other border, was decided in the, on the basis of uh, the 10-day personal use. We created a, a set of administrative bodies, the commissions for the dissuasion of drug addiction, uh, that have the possibility to apply some penalties. So uh, it must be clear that using drugs in Portugal is still prohibited. There's a clear sign from the, the power, from the government, of disapproval of drug use. But it is quite different, uh, and uh, this takes us back to the fascist period. When, uh, when we started offering some kind of responses to, to, to addicted people, most of them feared to approach those responses because they feared to be referred to the police and to the, the penal system. So, this uh, discriminalization was a very good sign of opening uh, the minds to the idea that those guys, those, those people, they need help and they can come openly with no fears of being uh, referred to the penal system. And uh, some, uh, some of the most uh, of the older people that uh, uh, feared to approach uh, those responses started to come uh, in a more, uh, much more decisive way to, uh, to, to join the, 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 the responses. This is the a table with the, the amount of substances that people can cannot 
uh, can carry uh, without incurring in a penal, uh, a penal penalty. Under this, uh, this amount of substances, people are addressed to the commissions for the dissuasion of drug addictions. This is not exactly uh, the same thing as uh, 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 drugs court. Uh, I, draw, uh, I must draw your, your attention for the, the case that uh, those uh, panels, those uh, commissions are under the Ministry of Health and the first goal of their, of their intervention is trying to identify the needs of this specific citizen that I have, that I have in front of me. Is he a, a drug addict? Does he need treatment? I can invite him to, to join a, a treatment facility. But uh, <clears throat> it's also, I, I used to, to say, uh, to this weight consumption is a, a, a sort of a second line of preventive intervention. It's uh, like the referee uh, shows the yellow card. You know, well, okay, you must think about your life. What's the role of, of drugs in your life? And you have the opportunity to address the, the responses that are available in our society. Uh, the goal is to ensure the sanitary protection of users and the community, and, uh, and it was also very important to liberate resources from the fight, fight against drugs, the supply side. Um, because uh, when, when the, the police forces and the customs uh, got rid of the, of, of the intervention uh, with, the, with drug users, they, they had the resources available to move on to, to sharks instead of, of, uh, of uh, working uh, only with the small fish. You know? Well, those commissions, uh, we have one on each district. As I told you, it, we have 18 districts plus uh, two autonomous regions. So uh, it's a total of 20 of those bodies. They are, um, they are uh, typically, they have three members, uh, one jurist, a psychologist, and a, a social worker appointed by the Minister of Health and by the Minister of Justice. And they have a team of a support team that evaluate and has the first contact with, with the uh, users referred by the police. They, they collect the social and the clinical records of, the, of the, the consumption and they present to the Commission to evaluate what, what would be the best uh, approach for, for, this, for this concrete person. Well, I, I'll, I'll jump on this, but there's a quite simple uh, process, uh, set of procedures. When someone is intercepted by the police, he must be presented to this panel in a period of 72 hours. Um, is intimated by the police to, to present himself. And, uh, well, the evaluation is, is done uh, very, very fast. And, and the people addressed to the to adequate responses. If, they are, uh, if we are dealing with a, a drug addict, he's invited to, to join a, a treatment facility. But if we are dealing only with uh, some recreational, occasional user, we try to evaluate also, if there are, there are any needs in terms of social support, familial support, psychological support, uh, that, can, that can help that that person is not becoming later a, a, a problematic user. Uh, so we, if we can interrupt that career, it will be very helpful. <coughs> of course, we need to have a, a, a very important network of responses in the society where we can address those users um, to, well, to, to, 
to find the, the adequate responses. There's a, a lot of uh, sanctions possible to be applied, but I must say that it's not very common that they are in fact applied. They come from provisional uh, suspension of the process until a, mo a monetary fee that is never applied to uh, a drug addict, only to, to other kind of consumers. When it, it was decided, when it, when it came into force in 2001, there was a lot of interest, uh, of, of international interest, a lot of visitors coming there, but we, have nothing, we had nothing to show at the time. So that interest just dropped. Uh, only now, 10 years, 11 years later, uh, when we started to have some results to show, well, a second wave of interest came. And then, in 2004, the International Narcotics Control Board uh, came to, li to, to Lisbon, very sceptical about the decision, but we, they were quite impressed about the evolution of things. In the World Drug Report, there was a positive uh, uh, reference. Then the Cato Institute, uh, the, the Glenn Greenwald uh, report on April 2009 started a wave of enormous interest on, on the situation. Uh, Caitlin Hughes and Alex Stevens uh, wrote a, a, a paper in the British Journal of Criminology in November 2010, very positive also. And, uh, and then a paper from the Open Society Institute came in 2011 about the benefits of decriminalization drug use. Well, I, I think my time must be close to the end, so I, have to, I must show you some results of this evolution. Now, this is the number of processes uh, that uh, were uh, raised in, in, in all the, those panels all, all over the country. It started in 2001, second half of, of, of the year, so we had 2,000 and something processes. Uh, and from then, uh, from then until now, around eight, uh, from six to eight thousand uh, processes a, a, a year. The most common administrative sanction uh, was uh, that was applied was the provisional suspension, uh, suspension of the process. Let's see. There's a first contact with the with the commission. Um, the, the person is addressed to a, a response, and the file stays open for six months, typically. If it does not show again during that period, if it does not relapse, uh, by the end of that period, the, the process just disappears. Uh, there's no, no, no criminal record, there's no trace of this. It, it, it was important in terms of stigma. Uh, because there's no, no record of this uh, episode. We can, <clears throat> uh, some, some sanctions can be applied, but is, uh, it's not very, very common. Uh, for instance, in the yellow line, it's the suspension of the process with people following treatment. So we have in, in 2010, we had, for instance, eight, 175 people that were addressed for treatment uh, as a result of their contact with the, with the commissions. Well, the most common, uh, commonly involved drug in these processes uh, is cannabis, by far higher than the others. Well, I must go, go on. I, should, I would like to, to show this, these slides. We are now finishing the uh, survey. We are waiting for the results of a survey that has been done on the general population uh, this year of 2012. I, I intended to bring you the results, but they are not yet available. So <clears throat> those are the results of the, the surveys of 2001 and 2007. There was an increase in the total population of the lifetime prevalence of any illicit drugs from 2001 to 2007. 
you can notice that in the older people, uh, the increase is, is bigger than in, in, uh, among young, young people. This means that this is a cohort effect. Uh, there are people, uh, it's, the users are getting older and not older people is uh, using more drugs. So I would say uh, like, like this. But we have this group of 15 to 24 years old. If we decompose it in the 15 to 19 and 20 to 24, we can see that youngsters were using less, experimenting less drugs, any kind of illicit drugs. This was from 2001 to 2007, and the preliminary results we have from the 2012 study are in line with those. What we have from last year, it's the prevalence study, lifetime prevalence study in, uh, among schoolers. People from 13, 14, 15 years old had an increase uh, from 2006 until now on the uh, total experimentation of, of use of, uh, of uh, drugs, but this on, uh, mainly about cannabis. All the other drugs are coming down. Of course, we are still uh, very much uh, uh, under the average uh, prevalence of drug use um, uh, in Europe among uh, people of this age. With 16, 17, 18 years old, there's a, a bigger increase in the use of cannabis in the last, in the last few years. All the other drugs uh, stay stable or decreasing. In prison, 2001 and 2007, prevalence of injecting drug use before imprisonment and in prison. 2001, before reclusion, 27% of people were using injecting drug use. 2007, only 18%. During imprisonment, from 11 to 3%. We have, <coughs> well, we have a quite uh, solid uh, network of responses uh, in terms of uh, those are integrated units that have teams of treatment, arm reduction, prevention and reintegration. We have 45 uh, centers for, for treatment and uh, plus 32 uh, places, uh, cons decentralized consultations. Three therapeutic communities from the state for detoxification units, two-day centers, and three alcohol units. But this is complemented with the NGO uh, system. IDT has the, has the capacity to, to, uh, well, to attribute license of work and, to, and to, to follow the activity of those centers and also to pay for, for the, the treatments they, they provide. For instance, we have uh, in therapeutic communities, IDT has only three therapeutic communities with, with uh, 56 uh, places, but there are, there are 1,500 and something in uh, NGOs, uh, therapeutic communities. This is the total number of clients in the public, net, the public network, uh, around 38, 37,000 people a year. Those are new clients every year, 7,000, 7, 8,000. This is the number of, of consultations. We had a drop here because we had to uh, dispense around 2, 200 professionals of the total of 1,800 that we had before due to the uh, economical crisis that we are living now. Just to show you the evolution of the, 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 age, of evolu the age evolution of the first clients on IDT. In 1999, you can see 20, 20, 24 years old was the, the average age of users. 98, 
2007, so we can see they are moving into the right. Okay. 2010, we had a slight comeback of uh, young people. <coughs> Distribution by year and main drug, as you can see, heroin was in 95. It was uh, only uh, almost 100% of our clients uh, were heroin users. It has been dropping sl slowly. Uh, cocaine is raising slowly, and cannabis. Those people that uh, seek for treatment are mainly addressed by the uh, commissions of the dissuasion of, of drug addiction. They are addressed to treatment. When confronted with the, with the the importance of their drug usage, they assume, they accept uh, to discuss it with, with professionals. Drug injecting on the previous 30 days before new patient uh, first consultation. As you can see, in 2000, 36% of our clients were using intravenously. In 2010, only 7%. It dropped dramatically. I must say, preliminary da data that I have from 2011, uh, there are a slight raise on it, uh, also due to, to economic crisis and difficulties that our people are uh, facing now. AIDS. IDU, in, in infection, heterosexual, homo, or bisexual. So you can see you had a huge problem with injecting drug use, uh, uh, HIV, um, infections through uh, the use of, uh, of drugs, and now it dropped. It's under the, the, the importance of uh, sexual behaviors as a transmission. Uh, this is the, the number of users and their opiate agonists through, the, through time. As you can see, there's a sustained uh, increase of, uh, of uh, methadone and buprenorphine programs. <coughs> well, just to coming to an end. Trends 2001. Small increases in reported illicit drug among, among uh, adults, reduced illicit drug among, among uh, uh, adolescents, reduced burden. As I told you, it was the first uh, concern of the Portuguese population by the end of, of the 90s. Uh, now it's the 13th problem, pro problem identified by the Eurobarometer. There's a reduction in the prevalence of injecting drug use in opiate-related deaths and in infectious diseases, a reduced uh, stigmatization of drug users, and on the supply side, increases in the amount of drugs seized by the authorities and the increased efficiency of police and customs forces. Uh, as I told you, they got rid of the small crimes and uh, they could act in uh, really important uh, areas. Just to, to finish, I would like to, to tell you clearly that we do not establish a, a causal effect of the criminalization to these results. Uh, I think it's the complete set of responses that was turned much more coherent under the uh, decriminalization framework. Uh, but uh, some, there's something that we can say for sure that decriminalization did not affect negatively the evolution of, of the phenomenon. So I would say that there is a coherent articulation among all the Portuguese policy and actions based on the idea that a drug addict is a sick person or some, someone who needs help, rather than uh, uh, being addressed uh, as a criminal or delinquent. The global drug situation in Portugal seems to have a positive evolution in all the available indicators. Um, those are some of the publications that have, they have shown during the last uh, years. This was uh, really important to draw the attention of the world to the Portuguese uh, situation, but uh, lots of them from Caitlin and others have, uh, have been important and the subject of study. We have been being uh, in the last few years under the international scrutiny Lots of people coming there to just to watch what has been done 
We are very proud of it, and we are very proud of uh, sharing it wi with you. Uh, through the press, there's also a lot of interest in the international press. As I told you, every week we have uh, foreign visitors from uh, researchers to, to people, professionals from the, from the ground, politicians, uh, journalists. Uh, and we, of course, we enjoy it, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but clearly uh, I insist in the idea. It's the complete package of uh, responses that uh, is important in, in not a silver bullet, uh, the, the question of decriminalization. We feel comfortable with it, but it's not magic. Thank you for uh, your attention. Thanks, uh, Dr. Galau. We have uh, just a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, if anybody would like to ask a question, I'll start by 